Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I think the remarkable thing about the human brain is its capacity for social engagement. It's a social brain in many ways. And um, it's the way that we can coexist and cooperate and live in communities and generate cultures, which I think is our defining feature. Now, of course, other animals live in groups as well. And indeed, some primatologists would claim that there is culture in other animals but nothing to the extent that we experience as humans. And so I, I really wanted to focus on the pro-social uh, capabilities of humans. Now this ability uh, to communicate, of course, is uniquely human. Our language is, is something which you don't find in other animals. But I would argue that in the evolution of humans, before language appeared on the scene, we had to have brains which were capable of sharing ideas, brains which were receptive uh, to living in groups. And so I think that must have predated the onset of language. And this is a, an idea that has been proposed by a number of thinkers, but I'm very much influenced by Mike Tomasello, who is the director of the Comparative Studies Max Planck Unit in Leipzig. And, my, uh, and Mike studies uh, developmental psychology in young children, but he also does studies of primates and monkeys. And um, he's argued that our brain is really pretty much pre-adapted for social engagement and culture. And he quipped last year, I think he captures it beautifully, I, he was giving an interview on the Horizon program, uh, which was made by Alice Roberts about human evolution. And he said that fish are born expecting water, but humans are born expecting culture. So this is really what the book is about. It's the pre-adaptations, the evidence that culture and pro-social behavior is very early, in many ways there before language appears, and the mechanisms which keep us being pro-social, mechanisms which enable us to integrate with each other, and most importantly, to avoid being excluded and ostracized. And in the book, I deal with this, the problems of ostracism and, and the effects that I can have on your health. And at the end of the book, I deal with what I think is a potential epidemic of loneliness that we may be experiencing in the modern society. So the book is called The Domesticated Brain. And I got the inspiration for that title by reading an article in that was the Discover magazine in 2010 by Kathleen McCulloch in which she points out a really strange oddity of human evolution. And that is that since the end of the last ice age 20,000 years ago, the human brain has shrunk by about the size of a tennis ball, 10 to 15%. And that was an alarming fact. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't like to lose that amount of neural tissue. And so that's very odd, because that stands in stark contrast to the generally accepted view that over the course of human evolution, for the past two million years, the brain has been getting larger, as indeed has the brain of other animals which live in large social groups. In fact, there's a direct relationship between the size of the brain and the size of the social groups that animals live in. This is known as the social brain hypothesis. So this seems an odd fact to find the brain's been getting smaller. If you combine that with the fact that the population exploded at the end of the last ice age, we know that by an analysis of the mitochondrial DNA, that the human population increased in vast numbers and we had to settle down into large groups. So why would a brain get smaller when we're settling in large groups? Uh, it just doesn't seem to make any sense. And in the article, a number of propositions are considered, but it was this notion of domesticity was the one that really captured me. The idea is that brains shrink as a byproduct when you become domesticated. Now normally when you think about domestication, you think about all the features of living in modern society. But domestication has a much older and scientific precedence, uh, most notably in the famous book on the origin of species by uh, Darwin. And Darwin, of course, uh, used the book to lay out his theory of natural selection, and it was based on his observations and his travels, but a lot of the argument was based on his discussion with um, breeders, animal breeders, who were domesticating the species by selecting those individuals with the desirable attributes and then breeding them together. And I've taken this quote from uh, the last pages on the origin of species because, well, first of all, I think it's great to have a famous scientist like Darwin acknowledge the importance of psychology, um, something I often have to battle with my colleagues. But he said that psychology will be based on a new foundation that of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation. Light will be thrown on man in his history. 
And what he's saying is that if you really want to understand humans, it's not enough just to know about their physical changes and the adaptations to physical environments. You have to understand the brain changing in addition to changing environments and the mind that that creates. In other words, he's proposing evolutionary psychology. And I think what went on at the end of the last ice age was in, indeed the environment changed, it got warmer, but then living in large groups needed us to select four uh, individuals who were better adapted, who were more pro-social. We had lived in groups before, there's no question about that, but this rapid increase in population required individuals who were much more uh, conducive to, to being amenable to others, getting on, communicating, cooperating. And I think that's what went on. So we were domesticating ourselves, choosing those individuals with these particular uh, traits. Now, the idea that choosing traits for pro-social behavior would change your physiology is supported by the work of Dmitry Belyaev. In the 1950s, he was a geneticist working in Russia, and um, he introduced a domestic program into the otherwise wild Siberian silver fox. So these were animals which were trapped and then kept in the farms for their fur. And what Dmitry Belyaev did is that he selected those individual uh, foxes who were more docile, less aggressive, didn't snarl when they were approached, and then bred them together. And he discovered that within about 12 generations, you could produce a completely domesticated animal. So they looked differently, so they, they had wagged their tails and they had fluffy tails and floppy ears. They behaved differently, they were kind of almost like playful puppies. In fact, uh, remember that puppies are domesticated wolves. And their physiology was changed, their temperaments were changed, and their brains had shrunk by about 10 to 15%. And indeed, if you look at all the animals which have been domesticated by man, they also have this similar brain reduction. So that's why I'm suggesting that possibly as a consequence of selecting those individuals who are more pro-social, this is how we underwent this sudden and rapid change. Now the human brain, of course, is incredibly adaptive. Uh, a newborn's brain is about a quarter the size of an adult's brain, but within, within the first couple of years, much of that difference is made up. And it's not because they're growing new brain cells. Babies have almost the full complement of brain cells. Rather, they're wiring up, because most of the brain is actually made up of connections. Uh, this is an image showing the major connections between the major processing areas of the brain. But if you go into the microcircuitry, if you go right down to the basic building blocks, this is an image of a, of a neuron, these neurons communicate with each other and they have vast numbers of connections, up to 10,000 each. And it's through the immense complexity of these interactions and signaling that we're able to store information. This is how the brain encodes representations of the external world. And indeed, it's important that you get experiences to form these connections because if you don't have early experiences, these uh, connections atrophy. So early experience can shape the brain. This is the process we call plasticity. Now, we know this from the work of Hubel and Wiesel, who studied this in the emergence of early visual processing, that if you raise animals in impoverished visual environments, their vision is damaged. But we're increasingly beginning to understand that the early environment also plays critical roles in social development. If you raise children in socially deprived environments, then this can have pronounced effects on their social development throughout life. So when you look at the brain, um, it has all these different processing areas, but we've been identifying areas which seem to make us capable of interacting and living with each other in very <laughs> complex environments. And so here are some of the uh, candidate structures. You don't really need to know the technical names of them, but I've identified eight of them, and I've segregated them into four different categories. There are structures which are activated by, first of all, in the blue, detecting the presence of others, so areas which light up when you see faces or bodies, or indeed register biological movement which is indicative of another human. You have areas which are um, activated when you're thinking about someone else. When you're imagining someone else's, uh, what they must be thinking or trying to take their perspective, what we call mentalizing, these are areas of the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and then there are areas, of course, which are activated by the emotions. A lot of the joys and the tears that we experience are often to do with social interactions that we have with other people. And so these are the areas of the amygdala and the insula. And finally, there are, uh, there's a system that's called, in general, the mirroring system that um, seems to resonate or copy behaviors when we watch other people doing it. And this used to be thought to be a, a mechanism by which young children learn by observation. But I think actually probably a lot of the mimicry is used to signal our affiliation with people that we like. So we tend to mimic and copy those behaviors and mirror those behaviors of individuals that we want to be affiliated with. Now, all these structures are, are present in the very young baby, um, but they undergo 
change and development and refinement through social interaction, especially things like mentalizing, which probably doesn't really appear until around the child is about three to four years of age. If you think about our childhood, it's one of the longest of all animals on the planet. Now, I don't think that's to do with education. I think we've evolved long childhoods, and we are dependent on caregivers so that we become um, enculturated, so we can learn the rules uh, about how to behave in social environments. If you think about it, parents are always telling their children to behave themselves. That's what it is. It's not really education, which is fairly recent in evolution. I think this is really uh, a mechanism which allows us to be, become members of the tribe. So from the very beginning, there is this pre-adaptation. The babies are showing all the behaviors which are indicative of pro-social behavior. They will smile when they're smiled at, so they respond to early social interactions. They will copy behaviors. They will cry when they hear crying. And they will seek out others who seem to be mimicking and duplicating their behaviors as well, that seem to indicate that their attention is directed towards the child. And these are the most important people for very young babies. You have to develop a sense of self. And that's essential for social interactions. Before you can interact effectively or functionally with another individual, you have to be able to have a sense of your own identity. And that emerges over the course of childhood. The first thing to appear really is a sense of self-recognition. This is something which is uniquely found in, uh, in social animals. For example, looking in the mirror and seeing your own image and knowing it's you. That's only found in humans. But it doesn't really appear until the second year life, and not uh, at all in animals which aren't social. Another uh, aspect of who you are is your gender. What, am I a boy or am I a girl? Or somewhere in between. And at this age, children are becoming aware of what are the characteristics. And they're reflecting and encoding all the cultural stereotypes that we associate with boys and girls. In fact, they're not just becoming gender detectives. They're becoming gender police. Because they're saying, well, boys can do that and girls can't do this. So they're really quite rigid about these early uh, markers. At three to four years of age, they acquire what we call uh, a theory of mind. And this is the capacity to understand what someone else might be thinking, to appreciate that they have mental states. Because prior to that, uh, very young children are egocentric. They assume that everything, everybody knows what they know. So they, they find it difficult to take another person's perspective. And of course, this is an ability which is impaired in the condition of autism, which is why they find social interaction, uh, one of the reasons they find social interaction is quite difficult. Self-esteem. They're starting to become aware and conscious of where they are in the pecking order. Because up to that period in time, they've generally just been the center of attention for the parents. But when they start to interact with other children, they start to become very aware of, of where they are in the standing. And so you see the appearance of behaviors such as embarrassment, blushing, all these measures where you're taking into consideration how you might be thought of by others. Uh, Self-control. They have to be able to control and regulate their own behaviors in order to have social interactions. If you can't control your impulses or your anger, then you're not going to be much good in a, in a social situation. And again, these are uh, developmental changes that we see which we can link to the uh, maturing brain structures. And then finally, autobiographical memory. Who am I? This is the awareness and the, the repertoire of memories and experiences that we can each recall when we, we think about our early childhoods. But it's interesting to note that hardly anyone has memories prior to their second or third birthday. And that's because I don't believe that the mechanisms are in place in which to encode this sense of identity. But once you have your identity, then you can set out in this social interaction, you can learn from the tribe, you can accumulate knowledge, and you can build upon it. And in the book, I describe the processes of interacting with others, what's considered appropriate behavior. And I want to just highlight a couple of them, altruism and punishment, I talk about. The way that children start to know who to help and uh, how to share, the emergence of sharing behavior about five, four to five years of age. In addition to this pro-social behavior, of course, you also have retribution and revenge against individuals who are trying to be freeloaders or trying to take advantage of the social situation. And in the final part of the book, I really focus on the consequences of being isolated. What happens to you if you don't have a rich, fulfilling social interaction, social life? And it turns out that actually it's really a health risk. Now, this is a recent study I found, and it's a meta-analysis, which is the gold standard for scientific reporting. If you want to know how strong an effect is, you do an analysis of all the studies which have looked at the effect, and you calculate what's called the effect size. And on the top three bars here, what we have here is a measure of loneliness and its relationship to morbidity. So this is a study of over 300,000 people over seven years. 
And the long and the short of it is that if you have good social relationships, you're 50% more likely to survive over that period of time. And that makes it a greater health risk than obesity, uh, lack of physical exercise, and indeed even moderate smoking. I know you, you are sympathetic to evolutionary psychology and the idea that... <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so kind of uh, and the idea that a lot of human behaviour is, is very deeply embedded in, our, in yes. our evolved structures. Is this a sneaky way to sidestep criticisms uh, of evolutionary psychology and saying, well, of course, culture is important. Look, it's culture that has made us evolve mm. to be the way we are now. It's, it's slightly sneaky. And, and of course, evolutionary psychology has a checkered history or with just so stories. We, we don't have time machines that we can go back and check. But it doesn't mean that it's a pseudoscience. There are real important, verifiable predictions. And indeed, uh, people who work in the field have, have have made great strides, in particular Steve Pinker, I think, is probably the champion of evolutionary psychology. But yes, just so stories are not very useful in moving science forward, because you have to have testable hypotheses. That's the whole point of science. It has to be a premise that you can check out. But I also think that you know, we are beginning to discover really interesting mechanisms uh, by which the environment can turn on and off our biology, and this, of course, is the processes of epigenetics. Now, I don't want to hand wave and say, well, epigenetics will explain everything, because this, again, is another just so type of story. But there's really good emerging uh, research identifying you know, genes and the roles of environments which seem to have predictable consequences. So it's early stages yet, but I, I'm encouraged by this, this marriage of, of psychology environment and, and what might be the genetic basis. Because most genes are silent. You know, most of our genome is actually quite, you know, is not signaling. So there must be some role of environment turning things on and off.